So, thank you, Dan, for that. But, uh, so Dan called me a couple weeks ago, asked if I preached this Sunday, and of course I said yes. And the more I thought about it, I realized that uh, this might be my last opportunity to preach here at you guys coming to church. Uh, maybe not. We still got a couple months. We'll see how that works out. But uh, we're in the middle of a series right now as we're going through the book of Acts. And uh, part of me, when I thought about this being the last time that I'd be able to preach, I thought, you know, maybe I'm just going to pick my own thing. Just kind of go off the reservation and, and what would I want my last sermon to be at this church? What would be the text that I would want to spend time studying and, and, and bringing here on Sunday morning? And then Dan called me and said, well, this is the, the, in the series we're in Acts chapter 20. So you can look there. So I looked at Acts chapter 20. And if you go to Acts chapter 20, there's three very distinct stories in Acts chapter 20. And the very last story in Acts chapter 20 uh, is a letter from Paul to the elders in the church in Ephesus. And it's this uplifting letter talking about their ministry there, the ministry that he had done with them. And it's also kind of a warning that he gives to the church. And I thought, well, wow, this, this is the message that I'd want to give to Two Gaps Covenant Church. This is perfect. And while I don't claim to have endured 99% of what Paul endured during his ministry, this is a message of encouragement. It's a message of warning. And it's something that I want to use this morning because I think that there are some truths in this letter that the modern day church still needs to hear. So before we go any further, if you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 20, and we are going to start in verse 17 all the way to the end. It's a long text. Bear with me. Now for Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord, with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained in the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay attention to yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce walls will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Remembering that for three years I did not cease, night or day, to admonish any, everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And we'll end there. It continues on as he wraps this up. But this is a fantastic letter to the church leaders in Ephesus. He's encouraging them in what they're doing. He's using his ministry there as an example for them. He talks about how they are to continue their ministry. And in that letter, he issues a warning about those who might come to destroy what has been started there. And he calls them wolves. Now, I know a lot of us in the church, we like to think we kind of easily or readily identify things that are going to come and destroy ministry. Things that can take people who are in ministry out of action. It's this obvious sin, you know, when we talk about uh, theft and murder and all these terrible things, and yeah, there are things that, that can rip churches apart. We even have a pretty concrete idea of Satan. I mean, if, if I talk about the devil, the first image that pops into most people's minds is this guy with red skin and horns and a forked tail and a pitchfork. 
But yet what we hear in Scripture is that these villains, these terrible things, aren't always so easy to spot. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. He looks almost righteous. He looks almost religious. We see that evil doesn't always necessarily look evil. Even false teachers who show up don't always have the snake oil in one hand and the greased handlebar mustache and the monocle. That's not how it works. Matthew chapter 7, 15 says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, outwardly, inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. We see that these, these wolves look just like the flock. They have the same wool as us. And here in the text this morning, Paul warns the elders at Ephesus that some of these wolves would show up from amongst their own ranks, from amongst the leadership in Ephesus. He said, even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. The wolves that Jesus and Paul are talking about look a lot like us. That's because often they are us. They're often people who are part of the family. Could be church elders. Could be preachers. Could be a Sunday school teacher. Could be me. Could be you. That's scary. Often wolves don't even realize they're wolves. They're so convinced they're right that nothing else matters. So we can actually end up being wolves without realizing it. How many of you want to be a wolf? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> right? Because Jesus didn't call us to be wolves. He called us to be sheep. But if wolves can arise from within our own ranks, how do we know when we've crossed that line? How do we know when we've gone from being a sheep to being a wolf? I would say when we become so consumed with our own power and influence, Paul tells us that these wolves distort the truth in order to draw disciples away after them. These are the folks that want church their way. That the rest of the church should be their disciples. Something we might hear is, this is my church. But there's a problem with that phrase. Because it's not their church. It's not your church. It's not my church. This is Christ's church. Paul tells the elders at Ephesus, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. But wolves don't think of it that way. They can't get their own way in church matters. We tend to forget whose church this is. Now Paul also says in Acts chapter 20, 29, I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. We're talking about some external wolves now. Things outside the church. So let's talk about this a little more. We know that these lone wolves from inside ministry can have an impact on how we do things. But the reality is, is we live in a world that is divided. We live in a broken world. And I don't have to look any further than my social media accounts or watch the news. Shoot, some days all I have to do is open my front door and look into my neighborhood to see that we live in a world that is divided. And sometimes as Christians, when we see things in social media or on the news and it seems like people are coming down on the church, it's our first reaction to strike back, to stand up for our brothers and sisters in kind. Sometimes it feels good to go nuts on somebody who's coming down on the church, right? Yet the world we live in has a real enemy. That enemy is not our government. That enemy is not politics. That enemy is not racial discrimination. That enemy is not class. Our enemy in this world is clearly defined in Scripture, and that enemy is Satan. The father of lies and the master of deceit. We have been fed the lie in our world that we must take sides. Rich versus poor. Black versus white. Democrat versus Republican. And these are all things which should be addressed by the church. But more often than not, our adversary uses these as a smokescreen to keep the church from realizing what its true mission here is on this earth. Now one of the best Analogies I have ever heard, and I'm totally stealing this from him. I can't take credit for this next analogy. Uh, 
came from a man by the name of Dr. Tony Evans. Anybody know Dr. Tony Evans? Mm -hmm. I love listening to that guy talk. I had the uh, pleasure of meeting Dr. Tony Evans a couple times when we were living in Texas. We were part of a church plant in San Antonio, and our lead pastor at the time, one of his mentors, was Dr. Tony Evans. Now, on top of being a solid dude, a good preacher, he's also the pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, which has a membership of roughly seven to 8,000 people. He is also the first African-American man to graduate with a doctorate in theology from the Dallas Theological Seminary back in the early 80s. And even more importantly, those of us who remember, because we're about a year now, I think, Ferguson, Missouri. When Ferguson, Missouri went down, Dr. Evans was one of the first pastors to show up in that town. And the first people he met with were the church elders, were the church leadership. And I listened to this talk that he gave to the leadership of the church, churches in Ferguson. And I can't help but see some parallel between Paul's word to the church leaders in Ephesus and Dr. Evans' words to the church in Ferguson. Now, Dr. Evans showed up in Ferguson in a time when there was division along racial lines, along political lines, and it's a time in our history that we're going to remember for a while. But he summed up the church's job with using a football analogy. So those of you who don't like football, tough. His analogy goes like this. On any given Sunday during the NFL season, in any given NFL stadium in our country, two teams take the field. The home team, and the away team. They wear different uniforms to distinguish themselves from each other. And every Sunday, a battle is waged on that field. One team trying to drive the ball into enemy territory, and by its very nature, this game is designed for one team to lose and one team to win. If a team is driving forward, the simple implication is that the other team is moving backwards. And this is the game. One team fighting another. And when two teams enter the field, they are automatically entered into conflict because they're going in different directions. The goal of the opposing team is to block their progress. And for three hours, we see war happen because the game is set up for there to be conflict. But what's commonly overlooked is that there is another team on the field. During that same game, as this battle rages on, there is a team of nine men who take the field, and they are the officiating crew. Nine referees whose job it is is to be on the field, but not of the field. They are supposed to be in the middle of the chaos without becoming part of the chaos. Now, up in New York, there's the NFL offices. And in the biggest office, behind the biggest desk, in the biggest chair, I'm assuming, is Roger Goodell, the commissioner of the NFL. And the commissioner has officiating representation on every field of play in the league. And at the beginning of the season, these referees are given a book, a rule book. The standard by which they call the game. They call the game by the book. And when a decision is to be made, they are to check with the book. Their opinions don't matter. Their personal preferences don't matter. Their job is to simply call the game by the book. Now, some of you remember a few years ago when the refs went on strike. And they were replaced with replacement refs. And what happened? We saw that order was replaced with chaos because they didn't know the book. The NFL office can only support their officiating staff if they're calling the game by the book. Now we know who these officials are when we watch the football game. They don't wear the colors of either the team on the field. Their uniforms are distinct. They are set apart. Now we live in a world 
built on opposing teams. Teams that our society has pitted against each other. Republicans and Democrats, black and white, rich and poor. And what God wants to do, what Paul was talking about in Acts, what God wants to do is put a third team on the field. A team that's not committed to politics or race or social status because they belong to another kingdom. And they too have been handed a book. And this book has been given to them by the commissioner. And our decisions as a church should be made by this book. Now, Dr. Evans goes on to say, sometimes the crowd's going to cheer you because they love the call you made. And other times the crowd's going to boo you because they don't. But you're not there for the crowd, you're there for the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Folks, it's about where our allegiance is. Is our allegiance to the teams on the field or is our allegiance to the king and his kingdom? You know, we talk about these wolves in our society. We talk about things that can eat the church apart. Some of them are obvious, and some of them are, are wrapped and thinly veiled in this over-politicized PC version of society that causes us to miss out on God's truth. And when that happens, when we, when we lose the sense of God's truth and God's purpose for our church, we've lost what it means to be the church. When Jesus came to this world, of course, we have to look back to Jesus and our example of how we do this. When Jesus came to the world, he stepped into, into a heavily politicized world. But he came to help people see beyond the political speak of the day. To help people see beyond the temporal and into the eternal kingdom of God. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used this platform to interpret life and meaning in a completely different way. A way that nobody had ever heard before, but it was true. Truth that was stripped of politics. Truth that was stripped of political correctness. He went so far beyond the rhetoric of the day that it was revolutionary. And it was far beyond what the Romans and the Jews of the day could even wrap their heads around. I've been reading a book recently titled The Politically Incorrect Jesus. And it is a good read if you get a chance. And in this, the author really takes a good look at Jesus' ministry that we see all throughout the New Testament. Now, before we get started, as Americans here in our culture, we like to surround ourselves with people who are like-minded. People who think like we do. Or the same beliefs as we do. In our culture, we're told we don't want to make too many waves. I, I personally have people who I am friends with on Facebook who have put things out there saying, if you disagree with me, I will block you. If you post anything about God or politics, I'm defriending you. Which is fine, that's the right, it's their Facebook account. But we've become a society where sticking with like-minded people has become our priority. The same with people who affirm us that everything we do, right or wrong, is the only acceptable thing to do. And yet that's not at all what Christ did when he was here on this earth. Jesus interacted with people very much unlike himself. He went to the social outcasts of the day and ministered to them. Jesus met with lepers and prostitutes and Samaritans, all of which were social faux pas of the day. And all too often in the church we read these stories, but we fail to see the significance in the modern day church. This, the PC police in Jesus' day were out to get him. This is a guy who claimed to live for something beyond this world, something that the ruling elite of the day could not even wrap their heads around. There, here was this Jesus guy out here building relationships with people when the world demanded rules. Jesus came to build relationships. The other thing we need to look at Jesus' ministry is that Jesus never compromised, and this is a big one here today, folks. Jesus never backed down. All too often in our culture, we are told to be peacemakers by finding a middle ground. Our society demands that we compromise on issues, whether it be sanctity of life, definition of marriage, and many others. And while it might feel good to find a middle ground, it is counter to what God has called us to do. 
If we as Christians believe that God's truth is truth, absolute truth, there cannot be any negotiation. If we're willing to compromise and find middle ground in regards to truth, then we're selling out. Or at the very least, being intellectually dishonest. And here's what I mean. Now, it's cloudy today, but I know above these clouds, the sky is blue. It's widely accepted truth. Now, the sacred society came to me and said, well, we think the sky is red. Okay. And we got 50,000 other people that said the sky is red. And I find middle ground. You know what? Let's just call it purple. It's a combination of red and blue. It's a good compromise. The problem with that is, this is why this is intellectually dishonest, is because instead of one party living in truth and one party believing a lie, now everybody is living a lie. Who's standing up for truth? I tell this story because there are some modern day churches who are trying really hard to find middle ground on a lot of issues, as, as though this would somehow make their ministry more palatable or appealing. But here's a newsflash, people aren't looking, people are not seeking a watered down God, and people are not seeking a watered down truth. People are seeking the real deal the same way they have been for thousands of years. And when I read Acts chapter 20, when I read about these wolves inside and outside of the church, I think of people who are willing to sacrifice eternal truth for temporal satisfaction. People who are willing to rip apart God's word in order to build their own ministries and serve their own agendas. Once again, Christ has to be the example on how we do ministry. Love and truth are the great equalizers. There is no amount of money that exempts you from the truth. There is no political affiliation that absolves us of our duties to the church and God. There is no race, creed, or culture that is beyond the love and grace of God. Amen? Amen. You say, well, okay, Pastor Kyle, we shouldn't be finding middle ground. Then how do we do ministry? Well, let's look at Jesus again. Jesus didn't find middle ground. He found common ground. As much as middle ground implies a compromise of beliefs, Common ground implies that we are finding a way to love and serve people in a way that is familiar to them. And this is exactly what we see Jesus do in the Bible. He went out of his way to minister to people who were outsiders. He went out of his way to minister to people who were living in sin. He sought opportunities to show love in ways that people couldn't even understand. Jesus didn't lock himself in the upper room with the disciples talking smack about people on Facebook. Jesus got out there. He went to people who needed the message of hope and redemption. And when he found them, he didn't condone their sin. He didn't tell them, you know, I know you're messing up. Just dial back a little bit. We'll be okay. He didn't, he didn't say, well, just keep doing exactly what you're doing. You're fine. He didn't say, well, let's change the laws. Maybe that'll help you out a little bit. No. He forgave them and asked them to go and sin no more. We see Jesus approach people in love. He didn't beat them down with words. He didn't condemn them. He forgave them. Being a Christ follower is about finding common ground. And Jesus did this the best. The Samaritan woman at the well in John chapter 4 is a great example. It's a cool story. We see Jesus went out of his way to find someone whose society said was written off. He should avoid Now I can't help but look at the story from the woman's perspective here too. Here comes along this man. No doubt she was expecting some sort of condemnation. So let me ask you another question. In our country today, how many people in this country do you think can tell you what evangelical Christians are against? Mm -hmm. A lot. Seems like the most vocal people who claim evangelical Christianity are people who are against something. So let me ask you another question. How many of those same people can tell you what evangelicals are for? Like the woman at the well, we have people in this world who fear evangelicals because they fear judgment and condemnation. And that's not our job. The Bible is clear that Jesus does not condemn, neither should we. Now, most of you know John 3.16, right? 
Probably one of the most widely known Bible verses in the entire Bible, even by non-believers, right? For God so loved the world. He gave us his only son. Whoever believed in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And yes, this is the same verse that we see evangelicals or people who claim evangelical Christianity put on a poster board right above some hateful, bigoted statement in judgment and condemnation. And for those and for us, I would say, we need to read the very next verse. Because John 3, 17 says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And we see this perfectly played out with the woman at the well in John chapter 4, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8. He forgave them both and asked them not to continue sin. But He never condemned them. Jesus allowed himself to be used to intersect with their lives to show them God's love. Now, this is a strong message to the church. And as I thought about this, as we look at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and we hear Dr. Evans' message to the church in Ferguson, I thought, if this is my last opportunity to preach to this church, I'm writing a letter too. So here's my letter to you. Judeach Covenant Church. To my brothers and sisters in Christ. I've served with you for three long years. We've endured the good and the bad. The wonderful times of seeing people come to Christ and put their faith in Jesus. Many of you I have served with, prayed with, cried with, and enjoyed life with. And as I leave this place for the next thing that God has in store for my family and I, I urge you to stay strong in the faith, to continue to serve, to love, and do life together in a way that let, lets God's love shine in this darkness. I pray that this family of believers will continue the work that's been started here. That as you labor together in Christ, that the fruits of this ministry would be seen in many souls one for the kingdom of heaven. C3 has been an honor to serve here. And it's not over yet. i got a couple months. But I pray that as we go forward as a church, that we rest in God's truth. And not the societal winds that blow from every a different direction every single day. I pray that this is a community that is rooted in God's word and God's truth. And continues to be so. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word and your truth. We thank you for your never-ending faithfulness to us. Lord, we pray that you would empower us to love others in your name. That you would equip us in, our, in your ministry to grow your church. That you would give us wisdom. We pray that you would embolden us to live our lives for you. That we wouldn't stumble around in shame, but that we would have confidence to stand tall in your word. That the world would see us for who we are as children of the King. Lord, be with all of us as we go out into our broken and divided world. And Lord, help your love pour into this world through us that others may come to know you. Amen. Amen. You can have the band.